everybody. Um, I appreciate you taking some time on your Sunday uh, to uh, kind of explore the museum collection with me and, and how we work at getting it accessible to you um, and to the public in general. Um, I want to give you a little bit of background first um, as to what we're doing and why we do it, um, for those of you who may not be familiar. Um, of course, the National Watch and Clock Museum is uh, the largest horological museum in North America. Um, we have probably what is the most diverse horological collection in public in public ownership in the sense of, of being a museum. Um, there are a lot of great private collections out there, but our collection is available and accessible to the public, and that's part of our mission statement as well, uh, is to foster interest in horology. So we work very hard um, at making sure that um, the objects and the artifacts that we are responsible for and we take care of um, are accessible to you, um, both as members of the NAWCC, but also as the general public. So what I wanted to do this evening um, is run through uh, a little bit about how you can use what is our online database, uh, which we call a, a Past Perfect Online. Um, and I'm going to start um, by giving you a little background on the software that's kind of behind the scenes. Um, the root software that we use um, for keeping track of all of our objects here at the museum is a pretty common uh, software uh, product called Past Perfect. And, and if you're on your screen right now, you're seeing uh, the interface that my staff and I use um, to enter data and, and information into, into our Past Perfect database. Um, it's very extensive. Um, you can see that we have uh, modules where we can keep track of things like objects, photographs, archival material, um, a library catalog if we chose to use that, which we don't. Uh, we have a different software we use for that. Um, and then there's all that wonderful stuff you see at the bottom, which is the kind of technical things that, uh, that our staff and volunteers use um, to access things. Uh, the interface that, that we use is, is pretty complicated, but it's also at the same time fairly intuitive. Um, this is an object screen um, that my staff use for entering in individual pieces into the museum collection. Um, there's a lot of information here. Um, which we use, you know, descriptions, the origin of the objects, uh, who made the object. Uh, in some cases, you'll see notes that are very specific to the object. Um, you'll see conditions or appraisal reports if there are any. Um, there's custom ones where we can enter in things like videos, and I'll show you a little bit about that uh, as we get into the online database. But this is the information, essentially, that we use um, to populate the online database. Um, whereas in the museum, if you come physically to the museum, um, you are going to see um, about maybe a third of our collection on exhibit at any given time. So at any given time, two-thirds of what we collect and preserve and conserve is not on display for you. So that can be, uh, it's, it's nice because typically, I mean, the best things we have are on exhibit. We, we try to keep the nicest things out on exhibit, but we do rotate pieces in and out. But we also have a really very in-depth study collection that scholars and researchers can use. Uh, and sometimes, at least when we folks come in here, they don't quite realize that because they're not seeing all of that information. And so what we wanted to do was uh, a few years ago when we were moving towards American Alliance of Museum Accreditation, uh, one of the things that I thought was very important was that we increase the accessibility of our collections um, to the general public and to our membership and that we do so in a way that allows them to really get engaged. And that involved not just the collections database, which we'll run through, but also some other platforms that we use and my staff use uh, in order to make sure that you can access us and access what's going on at the museum on almost a daily basis. And we'll run through that. So let's get down to nuts and bolts here. Um, the screen you're looking at right now is actually the uh, museum online database homepage. I'm going to jump out of that really quickly. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to the NAWCC's homepage, because this is where most of you are going to interact with it. Um, so right now, uh, assuming my NAWCC homepage is going to open, and here it comes. Um, this is the NAWCC's homepage. So if you're trying to get to our museum's collection database, um, the way you're going to go about that um, is typically uh, to come to the museum's page. So if you follow this, you'll see along the top, the, the uh, top menu item here, you'll see Members, Education, and the Museum. If you click on the Museum tab, um, that will actually take you to the museum's portion uh, of the NAWCC website. And the easiest and quickest way to get to our collections database is in the right-hand side, you see a little, little graphic over here that just says Search the Collection. 
and that is the quickest and easiest way to get it. I'm not going to click on that because it'll open up another window that I already have open. But if you click on this little graphic over here that says search the collection, it will take you to this page. Now, database searches are can be cumbersome sometimes. They can be a little bit you know, difficult. Um, we try as much as possible you know, using this how to use, this little quick uh, tutorial thing you see here at the bottom which says keyword search, advanced search, random images search, things like that. Um, but it's easier sometimes for someone to walk you through it because even some of our staff and volunteers sometimes uh, get confused and don't realize that what they can actually get accomplished with this database um, from this particular uh, interface. So it's really nice um, for you all to do this tonight because you're going to have some insights that a lot of folks don't have uh, other than folks who sit around in this building and, and play with this all the time. Um, we'll start first with a keyword search. Um, and keyword searches are, they can be really great and they can be really, really annoying. Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, in prepping for this this evening, there was a particular piece that I wanted to, uh, to show you and, and I'll show it to you when we go through here. And I thought to myself, well, I know it was made in Germany and I know it's a wristwatch. Um, so what I was going to do and what you might be inclined to do initially is go to the search area here where you see that and I typed in Germany wristwatch. Now the problem with this, and this is something you need to bear in mind when you're using our database, is what this will tell me is it will give me every single object in my collection that has both the word Germany and the word wristwatch in it, uh, which is not exactly what I was looking for. Um, so what I end up with is things like watch bands, watch bands, because it has the word wristwatch in it. So the problem I've got right now is now I have to narrow that. So if you're doing a search on this and you want to do it by keyword, you always want to use word, the word and. So if you're looking for two things that are, that are in one object, whether it's a Seth Thomas clock or a Germany wristwatch or a Patek Philippe wristwatch, you always want to use and. Because by using the and in the keyword, what it does is it only brings up those objects that have both of those things in it. So now instead of every object that has the word Germany in it and every object that has the word wristwatch in it, I now have only objects that have the word Germany and wristwatch. So that's one of the best ways to use the keyword search is always remember the and. Um, and that's sometimes I forget to do on a regular basis. But you can see what we're searching through here. There's over 30,000 records that we have uploaded um, every week. Um, my staff and volunteers here at the museum are updating this database. And every week we update the, the online version of this database. So this database is being improved and updated literally every week with more information, with more images. Um, to give you some perspective, uh, when I started here in 2007, our database had 1,500 photographs in it. We had over 11,000 objects and 1,500 photographs. Today we have close to 13,000 objects, but we have almost 20,000 photographs. So we've been gradually, well, more than gradually, increasing the amount of photography that we're adding to these records, which from the standpoint of you as a researcher on the outside, or a scholar, or simply an enthusiast or a collector, what we're trying to do is make this database more comprehensive for you um, provide a lot more information there. Um, one of the things we've also been, well, let me move on. We'll show and we'll look at a different record real quick and then I'll come back to this. So here's the wristwatch I was looking for. Uh, the number you see here, and you'll see these numbers with all these, these are what we call accession numbers or, or object ID numbers. Um, they're essentially inventory numbers. They're how we keep track of everything here at the museum. Um, it's very funny. Someone will say to me, hey, can I get a photograph for the bulletin of that wristwatch, you know, that paddock fleep? And I'll always ask them, what is the number? Because we have so many pieces in the collection that without having the specific number to, to, to use as a reference to find it, it can be very, very difficult. So that's what you're seeing here. And then the name, what you're seeing here is wristwatch. For us in the museum, uh, collections nomenclature, uh, the wristwatch is simply what we call the object name. So while you may have uh, variations on things like there's mantle clocks and desk clocks and shelf clocks, museum nomenclature is very narrow. And we've modified the nomenclature a little bit in our collections database to expand it. But we try to keep it fairly narrow and straightforward. So wristwatch. So if you come to this, I click on that one, and it opens up an object window. Now every one of these <coughs> pieces, all all the objects on our database, if they're here and we own them, are in this database. Now, we don't have images for every single object. We have images for most of them, but not everyone. And then on some of the images we have are older ones. Um, 
collections databases, the museum has been here since 1977. So the collections databases, you might call it originally, were three by five cards that are in a file cabinet behind my office over here that we don't use anymore. But those were the collection records in 1977. As time came on and as things became uh, uh, computerized and automated, uh, different software programs, MS-DOS programs, AS400 programs, Windows 95, uh, you name it, new software was used. And as time, over time, information was entered into this. And as you transferred from one system to another, as you upgraded from one software to another, sometimes that data was lost or sometimes the data was corrupted. And so a lot of these records, as we've discovered, as my staff and volunteers here who work on this have discovered, a lot of the data has been corrupted and we've had to go back and almost rewrite some of these. And it's nobody's fault. It's simply the result of this constant overlaying of, of systems. And after a while, it can get very difficult to keep track of all of that. The other challenge I will give you when we work on these, for this, this is a great example, this object I've pulled up here, this Lasher and Company, uh, World War II era uh, Luftwaffe uh, pilot's watch. Um, it's a wonderful piece in the collection and, and, and a lot of fun to, 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 to play with and look at and, and, and examine. But one of the things that we today in, in 2015 going on 16 museum work have to remember is that when this watch came into the collection in 1982 and was entered into the database in 1982, the person doing that work um, didn't have access to the internet, didn't have access to um, the immediacy of information that we have access to today. So they would have had to search for every single object in the library or in, or in, or in uh, scholarly publications or in patent records to get any kind of information they could. And so oftentimes the records are not as complete as they could be today simply because I can type this into Google and discover anything I want. Or as you can see here, I can go to forumswatchyseek.com and find a whole thread on this particular watch. So we try to be really cautious about being too critical of the early collection records that we have, while at the same time taking advantage of the resources we have today with the internet to, to provide even further research on these objects. When you come to an object record on the, on the collection database like this, um, what you're going to see is Usually the images will be on the left-hand side. Um, you can simply click on those images for a larger image, and it'll bring that up for you. Um, these images are, I believe, 600 by 400. They're 72 DPI. They're not publishable in any re respect. You could certainly use them on an internet or a web page, um, and you're welcome to do that with our images. We only ask that you credit where you've got them from. Um, and then you can cycle through the images for each object. So we try to make sure as we go along that what we've got are both movement shots as well as face shots and dial shots and complete shots. Um, that way you can see the whole package um, of each thing. On some of these, um, and I'll, I'll show you this a little bit later, there, you're also going to see videos. Um, this is a video of this watch running. Um, which is some of these watches are amazing. The minute you pull them out to photograph them, they just want to get, get going and start running. And when we do that, we try to capture that um, because we want to make sure, can I get rid of that stupid ad? Because we want to make sure that, uh, that you know, you can see that while it's in process. So it's kind of a fun thing to do. So that's the keyword search. So let me back up again. Keyword search, the thing to remember is always use and. So if you're going to do a keyword search, use and. Um, that way, um, you're always going to be able to find the two things you want. The other thing you're going to need to know about using the, the keyword search is if you want to look for something, we'll back up to what I said about not using and. If I simply type in Seth Thomas, what I'm going to get is every single record I have that has the word Seth in it and every single word I, record I have that has the word Thomas in it, not every, not necessarily just Seth Thomas items. If I want just Seth Thomas items, I need to make sure I put this then in quotes, just like this. Once it's in quotes, then all I will get are Seth Thomas objects. Now you saw, you might have seen I had a previous search here, Seth Thomas and Alarm, so we'll just run that one. You'll notice I used both of them. So I used Seth Thomas and I used Alarm. So what I've got are every single Seth Thomas reference which also has an alarm. So we'll click on one of these. So here's a Seth Thomas, little Seth Thomas travel clock. So you can use those in, co in coordination with one another. If you want an exact phrase, so if you want Seth Thomas, um, or if you want Patek Philippe, you need to put that in quotes. Um, and then you can add with the and anything else you'd like to look for with that. That's how the keyword search essentially works. Um, a very useful way to do it, it's, it's, um, it's, it's fairly quick. 
Um, you tend to have to cycle through a lot of things if you do that. Um, now there's another way you can do that, another way you can search this, and that's called the advanced search, which is a little more complicated, um, but kind of uses the same concept as using the and. Um, we're just loading it into the individual descriptions or place of origin or collection or material. So if you're looking for an object that is a wristwatch um, that was, let's say, made in Germany, whoops, made in Germany, um, and you, eh, let's see, what else can we put on here? Let's see, it doesn't really matter. Well, we'll just do that. So that's another way. We'll do that. We'll do a search. And what we get are those same records. Um, we actually got fewer records this time because we, we typed in a little differently. But we ended up with seven results. These are all of our wristwatches that were produced in Germany. I really wish I had more, but this is what we've got right now. Um, but again, it's another way to do it. Um, now, the other neat thing about this uh, database, and this is just a recent thing, well, I'll hold off on that because it's more fun later. The most fun way to do this, and this is what I do every morning, I think, practically when I come into work, is you come, we'll come back to the home page here. So this is the very first page you'll see when you come to the database. I love this little one. It's called Random Images. If you're just looking for something um, interesting that you, or you just want to kind of browse the collection, this is the best way to do it. Because once you hit random images, that's exactly what you're going to get. Um, you're going to get a selection of images um, that are just selected out of the database that you can just kind of browse through. Um, if you want to see more images, you just click down here where it says view more images. It'll bring up another random selection of images. When you click on this image, it'll bring that just that image up for you. If you want to see what that object is, you just see this where it says view catalog record here at the bottom. You click on that and it takes you to the page for that specific object. So this just tells you <clears throat> the information we have on this particular object. Um, we can go back to our random images again, and you can just kind of do that all day. Um, you can just browse through this and find all kinds of things um, that are just um, a lot of fun. We have all kinds of great stuff in here. And again, the images are there for you to look at um, for as much of this as we can. So this is that's probably the most fun way Keyword search is fairly quick, but you tend to have to go through a lot of things. Um, you know, sometimes you'll end up with a lot of results. The advanced search is a way for you to narrow a lot of those results down so that you end up with um, very specific items that are in the range of what you're looking for. The random images search is, a, is just kind of the fun way to do it, quite frankly. Um, it's a way just to kind of enjoy looking at the collection. And as I, and as I re I'll restate again, um, there's more free on display, so to speak, or on exhibit in this database than there is in the museum. So it's a nice way to take an opportunity to look at things that you won't be able to see if you come to the museum necessarily. Or if you're conducting research on a particular maker and you see that we have you know, half a dozen uh, watch movements by a particular maker, but they're not on exhibit, it's a way for you to kind of narrow down your research if you want to pay us a visit and, and kind of examine those watches more closely. It's just a nice way to do that. And all of the, the catalog numbers are there for you, so if you need to give us a reference for that, you can. Something we've just started adding, and it's really kind of the future development and growth of this collection, uh, of this database, is our archive module. Um, and the archive module um, we're working on right now with uh, Sarah Dockery, who's our library supervisor. She's in charge of that. And what we're doing is we're taking our finding aids from the archive records and we're putting them into PassPerfect as well. Um, now, we're not putting in scans of the actual objects, but what we are putting in are detailed listings of what's in each collection. So if you do a keyword search, everything that's in this collection, this is the uh, Christopher St. Daniel's Sundial Collection, which is an amazing collection of, of sundial material um, that recently was donated to us um, by, by him. Uh, what you're going to see is anytime you search any of these things, it's going to show up. We also have all the different subjects for this particular collection. And then the box, what we call container listings, are here. So what's in box one? Well. Uh, Victoria Cross and George Cross dial is in this is in box one. Um, another thing in box whoop, I, I don't want the odds that I would click on the same one twice. Um, this I'm not even going to try to pronounce that word, but you can see everything that's in every box is listed in the database. So if you do a search, if we go into keyword search and we type in nautical and we type in sundial for our keyword search, remember that I'm using and. This is what will actually come up with the Christopher St. Daniel Sundial Collection. So it will tell us that somewhere in this collection is information on that. Um, and so that's another way that we're, we're kind of enhancing the collections, the online collections database, as well as access to everything we have. 
Um, the museum collection is amazing, and I'm not going to argue that, that the three-dimensional collection we have isn't. But what is actually just as amazing, if not more so in some cases, is what we have in our archives. And our goal right now is to make as much of that accessible to our visitors and to our members as possible um, through things like this, this collections database, um, through scanning objects when we can do so safely, so that everybody can access what we have, know what we have, um, and be intelligent researchers when they come to the museum or the library to conduct scholarly research or, or study objects or, or particular aspects of horology. So by adding the uh, archive module to this, um, we're actually just completely and, and adding a whole other level to this that we think is going to grow over time. Um, it's time consuming to do the archive, almost much more so than it is to do the objects. Um, and and uh, Sarah has been very lucky to have volunteers and, and, and have folks who have been willing to help her with that who, who have knowledge of, of archival record keeping and can help her uh, enter this in. I think it's important um, for me to state that the museum and the library function very well, one of the main reasons we function so effectively is because we have incredibly dedicated staff, people, and volunteers here um, who dedicate an awful lot of their time and effort to making sure that the information that we have is the best it can be and to make sure that it's accessible to as many people as possible. So um, that's just a quick thank you to them if any of them happen to be listening to this, which they probably aren't, but that's okay because they're at home. Um, Objects are just the objects, but that's the basic database. Again, you can browse through this. You can see there's about 12,000 records in here right now, um, and then with a total of about 30, 20,000 images. So it's it's quite in depth, quite accessible. It's there. Use it. Um, this database costs us about a thousand dollars a year um, in order for us to make it available to you folks, to everybody. So it's it's very important it, to me. It's an important part of our of our growth and, and our mission. But it isn't cheap, um, and it isn't something that that uh, that we just kind of do because it's fun. It, it's something we do because we think it's important. Um, and as most things, most important things tend to cost money. But it's done we with uh, the folks from Past Perfect, and I can't speak enough for them. They're very helpful. Um, whenever we have problems with it or, or their issues, um, they're always very quick to help us out with it. So it's a wonderful system. Um, I certainly hope that you'll use it uh, as you visit the museum uh, digitally um, or remotely. Um, but there are other ways also that we try to make sure that everything we have here or what we have here is accessible to you or so that you can interact with us. Um, so I'm going to run through a couple of those for you um, just so you have an idea. Uh, when I started in the museum business uh, 25 years ago, um, museums basically needed a brochure, um, and they basically maybe needed, um, you know, advertising and collection, uh, convention visitors bureaus and things of that nature. Now, museums today are much more complicated. Um, in order for us to really fulfill our mission, um, we have to engage people where the people are, um, and quite frankly that's on the internet and usually when I do this talk about all of our internet offerings I'm doing it to a, a physical meeting of folks somewhere and I tell them that there's so much stuff for them to see but they have to be willing to get on their computers and see it but since I'm talking to you on your computers I don't think that'll be a problem so I'll just run through this for you. Um, we've had a Facebook presence um, uh, since 2008 um, this is our Facebook page as of uh, 11 hours ago when I updated it with the uh, webinar information about tonight. Um, you'll see where uh, the URL is at the top there. It's facebook.com National Watch, National Watch Clock Museum. They won't let me put an ampersand in there. Uh, we have about 7,500 folks from all over the world um, who have liked the page and interact with us on our Facebook page. We post a variety of, of different things on our Facebook page on a daily basis. Um, in many ways, uh, the things I'm going to show you tonight are, are ways that we you can see what's going on in the museum uh, almost every day. Um, every day there's something else going on. Um, and so every day we're putting things on the Facebook page. It's the nice part about a Facebook page or about social media is uh, we all have our smartphones out with us all the time here at the museum. So if we see something that's interesting, we're very quick to kind of snap it and, and put it out there for it to share with other folks or if we read an article that's interesting or we find something we think might interest our, our followers or our folks who have an interest in the museum, we'll be able to post those immediately. So the Facebook page is one way that you can interact with us. Um, it's, it's a nice way just to kind of see different things. You'll see there's a vintage Bull of a Wristwatch television ad there um, that we've put together uh, because of our new Bull of the exhibit we're putting on. Uh, we also have a Twitter feed. And our, our Twitter feed is a little different. Um, 
than our Facebook page. It's more kind of quick and dirty, and, and we try to do things like if we find an ad or, or, a, mar or a new watch or something that's of interest to us or, or a little video, uh, we'll use that. This is a, a video of a tourbillon movement uh, that George Thomas and uh, uh, <laughs> Ben's can't remember his first name, um, uh, worked on a, on a pocket watch, and this is from our Vine. We also have a Vine, for those of you who are familiar with it, Vine are these little short kind of six-second videos. Um, so we also have a Vine page as well, or a Vine feed, um, but we kind of crossed over there. But Twitter feed, we tend to post things like articles or, again, little objects that jump out at us that we think might be interest of interest. We retweet things from other places that we think might have interest to folks. Um, so it's just a nice way, again, to kind of quickly interact with folks. Um, as you can see, we've got almost 2,500 folks following us on Twitter, 7,500 following us on, on Facebook. Um, the more artistic we feel, uh, we'll go on to Instagram, which is just a photo posting uh, social media platform. So if I'm walking through the museum or if the curator or volunteers are walking through the museum, they're encouraged to snap a picture of something that kind of jumps out at them. Or if we're processing an object that we think is really interesting, um, we'll, uh, we'll actually kind of snap a picture of it and put on Instagram. And, 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 it's, and that's just a lot of fun. We love to interact with folks on Instagram. We have almost 1,000 followers there. Um, again, because they're, they're really interested in a lot of the very technical things and, and, and the beauty and, and, and the aesthetic aspects of, of timepieces. So it's a nice, fun way for us to interact with those folks. Um, another way you can actually engage with, with the museum, particularly with the objects in the museum, is through our YouTube channel. Um, you'll see it's NAWCC NWCM is our channel. A little cumbersome, but that's all right. And you can also search just by National Watch and Clock Museum. Um, we have several playlists, um, which we, we tend to keep updated pretty regularly. I'll just show you some of those. Um, we have some. We have a vintage horological films playlist, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, the museum and library um, have a, a pretty nice collection of vintage horological films. Um, that we've digitized and we can make, we make available through our YouTube channel. Um, we also <coughs> will find other uh, public domain videos of horological interest and, and post them there as well. Um, the Museum Objects and Galleries uh, playlist is the one that gives you an opportunity to see more of the collection. Um, so I tend to kind of focus on that for these kinds of things. But you'll see there's, I think, 50 videos in this, on this playlist of all different objects, watches, clocks, um, some behind-the-scenes things, you know, us having the Ansonia Street Clock arrive when we had that brought in, um, different watches. Again, what, what typically happens, what we end up doing, and it's, it's kind of sudden usually, is we take a watch out or a clock out to uh, photograph it. And it starts to run um, because they want to run. They have this life, um, so they, they like to run. So when they start to run, we try to capture that before they stop. We don't run everything here at the museum, and, and sometimes we're, we're very careful not to, depending on the condition it's in. But when it is running, we like to take advantage of that. And, and not just you know not just the high-end pieces. Um, you'll find <clears throat> on our YouTube channel and, and in the collection database, you can also see this video as well, um, you know, Here's a 1970s plastic child's wristwatch with these little children running around on a seesaw, and it's just a cute little thing. But it's, it wanted to run, so I let it run and took a video of it. Um, our job, you know, for our collection, and I've said this oftentimes to our, our curators and volunteers, even the even the simplest little object like that little 1970s watch is of of equal significance as anything else here in the museum. We preserve all of these things for a reason, and so. To, to me and, and to my staff, I hope, each object, regardless of whether it's a super beautiful Breguet repeater pocket watch or it's that silly little kid's watch, is treated with the same respect and dignity because for us, we're maintaining all these objects for the public good, for, for posterity, and I want to make sure we keep that uh, in mind as we work on that. Um, there are some other ways you can interact with us, obviously Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, YouTube. We do have a Tumblr page. As well, um, we also have a Pinterest page, uh, which is maintained by Katie, uh, who's our educator. She takes care of the Pinterest stuff. Um, so there's lots of different ways you can engage with the museum um, and almost literally see what's going on here on, on a daily basis um, because that's, we, we try to keep it updated on a daily basis. Um, we're all fairly tech savvy here, and so we can do that. Um, but if you're going to really want to look at the collection, the best way to do that is through our museum collections database. And I hope that you had a chance uh, and you've enjoyed this little run through of the database and it helps you as you're looking for the database in the future. Um, because I think that it's, I love having the database out there for folks to use. 
and I'm glad that it gets used. I'd like to see it used even more. Um, I, I enjoy it when I get uh, requests for images for publications and things of that nature because it shows me it's being used. So please use it and, and enjoy it and just have fun with it because I, I know that we do and we're putting things into it. Um, I'm going to step back here and let Katie uh, take over with some questions if she has any. Um, if any questions came through and I'll try to answer those before we, uh, we wrap this up. Okay, we do have uh, one question, um, Noel. Okay. Um, is the archive search linked to the keyword search at all, or does one have to search the archive specifically? No, you can use the keyword search to search the archives as well. Um, and I'll show you what I mean. I think we kind of did that with the sundials, um, but if we do, uh, uh, I don't know, what do we want to do? If I, if I do Seth Thomas, let me think here. What do I know I have in there? Okay, if we do sundials and and then we select some other option like uh, queen mother, let's say, because we know that that was in there. I'll put that in quotes because if I don't put it in quotes, I'm not going to be happy with the results. When I hit return. Yeah, what, what you're seeing is there is something in the Christopher St. I can never change Daniel Sundial collection, um, which will cross-reference into that. So it's, um, you can use the keyword search. It will go through that as well. It's set up to do that. Um, again, we're, we're working. We're just starting with the archives, so there's so much information in here. Now, let me say this. Once you get to this page, one of the things you can do, um, if you're looking for a very specific keyword, and, and then I would recommend it, is to use your browser. Now, I'm using Chrome right now. I'm using Google Chrome. But you, if you're using Internet Explorer, uh, Firefox, uh, Safari, there's always a Find feature in your browser. And on Chrome, it's just over here. If I go to Find, and I remember I typed in Sundial and Queen Mother. If I type in Queen Mother, oh, look at that. took me right to it. So then I click on that, and it tells me where to find it and what record it's in. So it's associated with that record, MG22. So now you could tell the, the librarian or the, or the archivist that you're looking for the references to Queen, Queen Mother in this Daniels collection. So you can use the find feature on your browser once you're onto the page for the archives to kind of narrow it down for you a little bit. But there is a lot of information in the archive, archive records, and we're trying to find the best way um, for the keyword search to work with that effectively. OK. Uh, another question from Michael is, is there a video walkthrough of the museum on this presentation or the website so we can see the building and its collection? There is not. Um, we are working, we actually, I can't say we are working on that. We are partnered with uh, Google Cultural Institute. Um, and the Google Cultural Institute is, um, they, they do, uh, essentially if you're familiar with Google Street View, um, they do street views of, uh, of museums. So they're walkthroughs of museums. And their crew was here um, this spring, I guess it was, with their little device they used. And they did a complete walkthrough of the museum um, using that device, a street view of the museum. And that is still being worked on. As soon as we have that information and that uh, ready to go, we'll have that out there as well. Okay, and that looks like that's all the questions. So I'd like to uh, thank Noel again and thank everyone for attending this evening. And please, if you have any uh, questions in the future, um, don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you all very much. Thank you.